Unit Nine, preparing to answer one. Exercise Two. Alex is a student at university. He has handed an essay to his tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the next essay he writes can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hello, Alex. Hi. Well, I was impressed by your essay. It's certainly an improvement on the previous one.、Mm, that's good news. I worked on it for a long time, and I remembered the things you told me to do in our last tutorial. I can see that you did. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. In particular, you make points clearly and then support them with evidence, as we discussed. So that aspect is all right. Definitely, but you could still do some work on the structure. All the points are good and well supported, but I didn't really sense an argument developing. It seems more a list of points. Okay, I see. As you suggested, I read some other essays and tried to use a similar technique for the structure. I thought I structured my arguments better this time too. I was quite pleased with the results. Well, it's an improvement on your previous work, and this is still only the first term. I'm not expecting perfection at this stage, and there are one or two other small things you could look at. You still give your opinions in a way which is too personal. It's okay to say what you think, but it should be a supported argument, not just a sentence beginning with "In my opinion." You did that three or four times. So I shouldn't do that. No, not in formal academic writing. You should always write in a more impersonal style than that. Okay, I see. And there was one other thing. Uh, what was it? Oh yes, <laughs> the length of the paragraphs. They're too long. In the second paragraph, for example, you make two main points, and it should be two shorter paragraphs. Okay. Yes, I can see now that should be two paragraphs. I'll be more careful about that next time. Good. It's not a difficult thing, really. I'm sure you'll get the hang of it soon enough. Is there a maximum number of words for one paragraph? Hmm. Interesting question. Not really, but each paragraph should have one clear aim. In some academic books, paragraphs occasionally go on for several pages, but the writer will usually be making one main point. Yes, I've read some like that. Shorter paragraphs are certainly easier to follow. Yes, indeed. And in undergraduate essays, unless there's a very good reason, a paragraph shouldn't normally be longer than three or four hundred words. If you find one has come out much longer than that, see if you can find a way to divide it into two. Okay, I understand. I'll remember that for next time. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The only major problem is one point you make towards the end, in your penultimate paragraph. You said that Antarctica remains the world's last unknown continent. What did you mean by that? Well, um, we don't really know very much about it. Just that it's very cold. <laughs> But that's not really true, is it? There are dozens of scientific bases there, with thousands of scientists collecting data. What you said was true a hundred years ago, but not now. A huge amount of information has been collected about what's both above and below the ground there. Yes, I hadn't really thought about that. I know, for example, a company called Escom has been exploring for oil and minerals there. I read about it recently. Well, that's true, but it's not really what I was thinking of. Mostly, there's been a lot of research into climate change. Some of it done by this university, in fact. Some regions there have been studied in much more detail in that respect than most places in Europe and America. 
Yes, of course. I hadn't really forgotten about the scientific exploration angle. I suppose I just meant that there are large areas that have never been visited by people. There are, of course, but it's all been closely mapped by satellites. We know what's there, even if nobody has seen it with their own eyes. So, did I lose marks for that? Well, to be honest, yes, a little. But don't worry too much about that one small point. In general, it's a good piece of work for a first semester. Well done. And I look forward to reading the next one. Okay, thanks very much. Unit 9. Focus on formats 2. Exercise 2. It's not only natural changes and local residents' activities affecting the water supply. Few tourists used to venture into this inhospitable region, but an ever-increasing number of camel trekking adventure tours and the like are bringing in more and more visitors. Their demand for water has put even more strain on an already fragile ecosystem. Some Western tourists use more water in two weeks than a Saharan resident uses in six months. On the positive side, visitor awareness of these issues is increasing, and there have been several successful ecotourism initiatives. Nevertheless, far too many visitors still regard the Sahara as an adventure playground and have little respect for its local people. Unit 9. Preparing to answer 2. Exercise 2. You will hear a talk by a college lecturer about an early method of printing photographs. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. My name's Alan Wood and I'm a lecturer in graphic design and printing. I'm often asked by my students how it was possible to print photographs in books, magazines, etc. before the technological processes we have today were invented. Well, a number of techniques were developed, but the most successful was called photogravure. We tend to think of the mass printing of photographs as something that only became possible in the late 19th century. But in fact, photogravure was developed in the 1830s by one of the pioneers of photography itself, an Englishman called Henry Fox Talbot. The original process was rather limited in what it could do, but in 1852 Talbot patented his photographic engraving technique. This technique was capable of printing good quality images of both photographs and photographs of illustrations and works of art. In fact, to begin with, it was probably more widely used for printing photos of artwork than for printing photos of people and places because there was more commercial demand for that. Talbot's process was refined by a Czech painter called Karel Klitsch, and in 1878 he perfected a significantly improved version of the technique. This is called the Talbot-Klitsch process, and is still in use today for making very high-quality prints. However, it's now only practiced in a few dozen workshops around the world, and I'm sorry to say that production is in decline at the moment. So, how does the photogravure process work? Well, it's quite complicated, but I'll give you the simplified version. To begin with, you need a sheet of very smooth metal, usually copper. You then attach the photo you want to print to this metal sheet. The next stage I don't have time to describe in detail, but it involves using acid to burn the surface of the metal. This eats into the areas covered by the darker parts of the picture more than it eats into the lighter parts. Then the acid is washed away, leaving holes in the surface of the metal. So, for example, if you were working with a picture of a zebra, the black stripes would be the deepest holes in the metal, 
but for the white stripes, there would be no holes at all. Grey parts of the picture would be holes of varying depths. The next stage is to apply a special type of thick, oily ink to the metal plate. This has to be spread very evenly, and it's important to make sure that the ink is pushed very thoroughly into all the recesses, or holes, as I referred to them earlier. When the plate is ready, a piece of paper is pressed firmly onto it. This paper must be slightly wet, so the ink goes onto the paper in a smooth way. Then the piece of paper is taken off and left to dry. If required, the metal plate can then be inked again and another copy made. In this way, one metal plate can produce many copies. One of these metal sheets won't last forever, of course. If it's used for making hundreds of copies, eventually the paper will wear away the surface of the metal and another plate will have to be made. These days, the technique is mostly used for short runs of tens of images. Of course, this process is incredibly slow in comparison with modern printing techniques, and the costs involved are large. So, why does anybody use it at all? Images made this way have a very distinctive character, quite different from images produced with modern printing techniques. The few workshops using this method today mostly use it for producing short runs of art prints, each one selling for hundreds or even thousands of dollars. Nowadays, it simply wouldn't be economical to use it for printing pages of books and magazines as it once was.